Welcome to today's webinar, Linking Structural Design and Revit. My name is Dan Monahan, and I'm the Managing Director for SIA Inc., a Nemechek company. Uh, today we'll be discussing some workflow issues to help engineers link structural design and their Revit workflows. With me I have Ben Follett. Uh, ben is a structural engineer with Nemechek SIA. He's completed his undergraduate degree in Penn State, where he received a bachelor's in architectural engineering. Prior to his work in the software industry, Ben was a structural associate with Michael Baker Corporation and ENR Top 50 AE firm. Ben is currently a structural engineering consultant with SIA Inc., where he provides technical sales and support and helps customers to define different BIM workflow strategies. Ben? Thanks, Dan. Like Dan said, my name is Ben Follett, and I am a structural engineer working for SIA. And today we'd like to talk about linking structural design and uh, Revit structures. Um, for some of you, Nemencheck may be a new brand, so I have a few slides um, on the company. You may be surprised to know that Nemencheck is one of the world's largest AEC software developers outside of the U.S. in what we call the EMEA region, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. We develop software across the architecture, engineering, and construction markets used primarily in design, building, and management of projects. Uh, a few facts and figures about, C, uh, about Nemencheck. We've been in, a bit in business for 50 years. Um, we have 1.8 million users across 142 countries. And we also have uh, 1,700 employees worldwide. Now, Nemencheck may be a new brand to you, but we're more known for our design-oriented brands, software like Allplan, Europe's leading 3D BIM application for design and modeling of concrete, Archicad, one of the world's most popular BIM applications for architects, Vectorworks, a line of 2 and 3D design software that has gone on to become the best-selling CAD program on the Macintosh and a leading design program on Windows. Lately, though, the group has actually gone through acquisition. At the end of 2014, we acquired Bluebeam, the world's leading creation, markup, and collaboration technology for a paperless workflow. And more recently, we acquired Solibri Model Checker. Outside of North America, we are more renowned for our engineering and construction-based technologies. And the technology that we're going to talk about today is uh, C-Engineer. C is actually a, a part of a new breed of integrated three-dimensional structural design programs. And while it also may be new to you, it, it's really not a new software. It's got a long development history. Um, we're actually celebrating over 40 years. Um, and as you'll see in the presentation, it's a proven solution that offers some very nice benefits to firms using various BIM interoperability workflows. So what are these workflows? Um, so more and more engineers are really being asked to participate in these collaborative model-based interoperability workflows. However, plugging into these workflows can be difficult with traditional engineering design software like RAM or RISA. With that in mind, the goal of, of today's presentation is really to discuss the various interoperability workflow options that exist and how each of these workflows offer benefits and flexibility when exchanging structural analysis data between Revit and design software, in this case, um, C Engineer. The first floor workflow that we're going to explore will be the direct analytical model workflow. This is maybe the one that you're most familiar with. Um, it's the analytical model workflow that most other softwares uh, support. For our particular development of our analytical link, we have a strategic partnership with Autodesk through an authorized developer in the UK um, named CADS. So many of our customers who are using Revit um, maybe don't pay attention or don't use or, or don't manage at all the analytical model. Um, in short, the structural model objects within Revit all have associated analytical lines as long as the enable analytical model checkbox is active. This analytical line may need to be adjusted before exchange with, between Revit and analysis software occurs. For this purpose, Revit actually has some very basic analytical model tools which allow the user to adjust various properties of the analytical model, including 1D member end extensions, openings, um, wall adjustments, and then other analytical line adjustments as well. Now that we have a little bit of an understanding of what the analytical model in Revit is, let's take a look at how it's used to transfer data to C Engineer. The geometry in this model appears to be simple, but if you're using software like RAM or RISA, you know that these represent common conditions that may cause problems when trying to link directly with Revit. So the Revit to C link is bidirectional. It supports steel, concrete, precast, 1D and 2D sloped and curved members, various openings in 2D members, 
and then also mixed material constructions. Before we go ahead with the export, it's important to understand that the model exchange between Revit and SIA utilizes this analytical model. Within both softwares, it's possible to manipulate and manage that analytical model such that the transfer is as accurate as possible. For this particular demonstration, we're going to focus on the tools uh, for the analytical model that we find in SIA Engineer. Now, within our particular link, we have some PDF documentation, uh, including best practices, and as well as a getting started guide. Um, if we look at the options here, the options include the code, the, the particular version of C Engineer, a lot of import and export options, as well as our preferred mapping tables. We can see here the US mapping table being of highest priority for our particular transfer. We could also enable or disable tables or actually map our own Revit families. We can also go ahead and look at the user mapping table, allowing us to expand the mapping beyond just what is shipped in our particular software. Now when we're done looking at the mapping tables, we're going to go ahead and click export to see engineer. We're going to choose a location and save a .r2s file, a Revit to see a file. During the export, it's going to identify the different categories of elements and then identify the mapping from the library in Revit to the library in SIA that needs to be taken place. With the model created, we can go into SIA, choose File Import, and then choose to import a Revit file. And then we're going to go ahead and select the Revit file and choose Open. We'll make sure the code matches and then import the information. Now this import is really an exact one-to-one -one import because of that analytical model information. So we can see here that analytical model that was brought in based on that analytical model in Revit. And if we go ahead and zoom out, and I'll turn on the rendering, we can see the different cross sections. Now invariably, once the model is into Revit, or excuse me, into SIA, we need to make some changes. So in here, I'm going to make some geometric changes. I'm just going to change the position of this particular node. I can also go into the structure service and add a 2D member opening to this particular mi mixed material uh, part of the structure. And so I'm just going to model any, any kind of opening here. So it doesn't really matter, but just any geometry of an opening. So we've added an opening. Now I'm going to go ahead and actually add some new data, some new um, geometry. And so in this case, I'm going to use the geometric ma manipulation command move, or excuse me, copy, and I'm going to copy that geometry. Now with all those changes made, I can choose instead of import to choose to file and export this data back to Revit. So we'll choose file, export, Revit file. We'll save it as the same file so that um, all the information is the same, all the, all the call outs are the same. Once the information has been exported, we can navigate back into Revit. And instead of using export, we're going to use the review and import command on the, on the tab. So when we choose review and import again, we choose the same file. And now the new, over, the new information now will overwrite the existing information. So we can see the changes that are made both graphically and in this list. So we can see the new items that were added, new openings, new cross-section changes, new positional changes. We could choose to import only certain objects, or we can choose to just import everything. In this case, we'll choose to import. It's going to read the different elements, even in this case, load cases. We're going to read through the columns, beams, change the positions. And all of this is done based on unique identifiers that were created in Revit initially within the project. And so it understands that a specific beam changed shape or changed geometry based on that unique identifier. Now, once the transfer is done, we can close out of the link itself. And we can zoom out and look at um, the model. Now remember, this model and this transfer is all based on that analytical model. And so if we go ahead and look at that analytical model, it should be really a one-to-one -one representation of the analytical model, that centerline-based model that we created in, in C Engineer. Now it's also possible to send analytical results from C Engineer to Revit using Revit's structural analysis toolkit. The results include reactions, deformations, 1D member, and even 2D member forces um, you can see here in these contour plots. You can use these for all load cases and combinations uh, and view them graphically. Or additionally, we could take the beam end reactions that we would find in 1D member forces in SIA and import them into Revit via um, the beam annotations tab. And so here we can see the annotations as reactions right on, on the beams themselves. Now, since the link between C Engineer and Revit structures is bidirectional, it's also possible, and in some cases really even practical, to begin the project in C Engineer. 
So again, this is possible because of this centerline-based analytical model in SIA. So in this case, this is why AECOM um, utilized what I call this idea of structure driving architecture. So uh, C Engineer was used to design the roof structure of this Spartak Moscow Stadium. In this project, AECOM modeled the entire roof in SIA because of the advanced modeling capabilities, and really so that the engineers could have control over each and every aspect of the modeling and analysis. Really, some of the modeling was changing as the roof structure needed to uh, the roof structure was changing based on the, the model and also based on the loading. Now in this case we can go and just import the structure into Revit after we were finished with it in, in SIA. Once the import's complete, we're really just using Revit for really what its main purpose is, is to create our final documentation. So in this case AECOM used Revit to then create final documentation for plans and sections and elevations and, and also 3D models to exchange with architects and, and other disciplines. And so, all, again, all of this is possible and all of this works um, very practically because of that analytical model that was set up um, directly in uh, C Engineer the first time. And so if we can go ahead, we can look at that analytical model. So here's that centerline based model. And that centerline based model is used to derive that three-dimensional model that we see here. Now, in many cases, viewing the analytical model in Revit shows connectivity issues, and that's probably something that most of you have um, experienced if you've tried to link analytical software with um, Revit structures. Now, these issues tend to occur for a variety of reasons, but the most prevalent just being that people don't pay enough attention to the analytical model or don't pay attention at all to the analytical model. And so for most analytical softwares, this is a real problem. However, in C Engineer, we can really solve these issues using some of the alignment tools that we find in the BIM toolbox. In this example, though, we're going to first export the R2S file. So here we'll export the R2S file just the same way that we've done before. Once the R2S file is exchanged, though, I'm going to utilize some of the visibility filters in Revit to show um, some of the objects that weren't exported in the link. So I'm going to change my visibility filter and then show only the foundation elements. Now these elements were purposefully and, and get it, were ignored in the link, and we're going to actually export these elements um, via the IFC file format. So I'm going to choose IFC. I'm going to choose that I only want to export the elements that are visible. So it's just a selection based export. And we can go ahead and export that and save that file. Now with both of those files we're going to complete um, a hybrid workflow. But we'll talk a little bit more about the IFC file format and the hybrid workflow a little bit later. So now we can go ahead and import both files into C Engineer. We'll first select to import that R2S file, that Revit to C a file. Now, once we go ahead and, and, and finish the import, we can really see some of those connectivity issues that we first noticed in Revit. So we can see all the additional nodes and how all the beams and braces and columns, they don't connect locally at, at one point. Before we go ahead and solve these issues with the alignment tools, um, we're going to go ahead and use the update feature, which will update a model, add geometry to a model rather than creating a new model. We're going to update using the IFC model, so that IFC foundation model that we created. Once the update's complete, we get a um, little uh, graphical window here that shows us what we've added new, which is in green. We can go ahead and look at the individual elements so I can see, okay, what individual general solids did we add? We could toggle on and off some. We could choose to actually not delete the, the elements that already existed and then click to accept any changes. Now that we have the full model, we can go ahead and utilize the BIM toolbox to align the structure. So if we open the BIM toolbox and then click on Align, we can see the alignment options on the left side of the screen. We're going to decide to proceed with all entities, so we're going to align everything. I'm first going to enable the live preview so we can see graphically a preview of what's happening in this particular model as we align it. Secondly, we're going to go ahead and turn on the alignment for 1D member planes and also extending 2D member planes. And finally, we're going to turn on that we want to keep the openings. We don't want to do any alignment with the openings. We want them to stay as is. We can start to see with the live preview how the alignment is going to, to take shape in this particular structure. Now if you don't want to look at things graphically or you want to have a little bit more control over this, we can look at the master planes list. So we can see the different uh, 1D member planes and we can actually disable the, any alignment that would occur based on the diagonal braces in the structure. We can go ahead and look at other planes or we can look at all the planes to see exactly what planes are going to be used to align the, the structure. Finally, this alignment is based on uh, 
master settings for distances between local nodes and, and faces and edges. We could change those and then just hit run align. After the alignment's run, we can go ahead and actually take a look at what's happened. In this case, you'll see there's only now one node here. We've now uh, eliminated these additional nodes. We've pulled the alignment in as we need to. Finally, we can go ahead and use SIA's connection tool to not only connect all the elements, but also automatically create composite uh, members. This now means we're well on our way to um, adding loads, doing analysis, and creating design output for this particular structure. Now, since most of the companies that we meet are, are really not using that analytical model in Revit very often, a separate workflow which allows for the exchange of structural model information really is required. Um, the structural model information can be exchanged using that IFC file format that we spoke about earlier. For those of you who don't know, IFC is a vendor-neutral BIM file format which utilizes object-based data models for the exchange of information. These object-based reference files can be imported into structural analysis software where they can be used to directly or indirectly create analysis models. So this workflow offers quite a bit of flexibility over the analytical model workflow, really primarily because of the types of objects that can be exchanged. So really, there's no limit to the types of objects that you can transfer, and they're really not tied to any predefined set of mapping tables that exist in Revit or exist in SIA. So really offering you a lot of additional flexibility in the geometry that you want to be able to change. With that in mind, let's go ahead and take a look at how this process would work using IFC and SIA Engineer. In this particular project, we're going to go ahead and import data that we're going to directly convert into native SIA structural objects. So I'm going to choose to import an IFC file. So in this case, it's going to be an IFC uh, precast parking garage. I'm going to choose to import the information as reference model geometry, so just generic three-dimensional solids. Once the geometry is imported into C Engineer, we can go ahead and see all the geometry. The first thing I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to change the visibility filters such that we can see everything transparent. That's the way I can just grab and see all the conversion of all the elements at the same time. Now with that set, we can go into the BIM toolbox, and instead of using a line, we're going to use the conversion tools, the first one being a convert of a general solid into a beam or column. So now we can select a column, and we're going to convert this directly into a native C object. So it's going to choose one beam, and it's going to recognize one beam now as a 24 by 24 concrete column. Now if we want to do this for all the columns, since there's intelligence behind the IFC model, we can select one column and choose the role of the member, which is column and use our filtering tools, our select element by properties tools, to select all the columns and convert them all at the same time. So in this case now we have all 72 columns in the project that have now been recognized as those square concrete columns. Now this doesn't work only for beam and column members, this also works for two-dimensional members. So if we go ahead now and select one of the internal walls, we can use the same filtering tools to select all the walls, regardless of their location, regardless of their thickness, and we can create them as native C objects by running the, the conversion tools. Now one other advantage of this reference model workflow is being able to leverage non-structural data in C Engineer in order to create an analysis model. In this example we imported the entire architectural model from Revit, seen here in blue, to create our structural analysis model. This collaboration of, mo of models within the analysis software allows for efficient coordination of design changes. So the, since the reference model can be anything, it doesn't just have to be architecture or structure, we can also import other model information like the mechanical engineer's HVAC model for coordination. In this particular project, this central tower of this building housed an open atrium, which is a very important architectural feature, as well as the main mechanical systems here shown in orange, and the structural core shear walls of the building. So having this geometry in the analysis software, having this mechanical geometry, allowed the structural engineer to input proper area loads for the mechanical rooms, add additional line loads on the roof for hanging ductwork, and identify the locations of any wall penetrations in the shear wall. Finally, the architectural, mechanical, and structural models can be shown together in one large model in order to check for clashes and coordinate changes. So this reference model workflow provides engineers really the opportunity to leverage data from any BIM software, including Revit, creating flexibility in the workflow and removing the dependency on Revit's analytical model. 
So uh, just a little bit more detail about this particular project. We can see here the architectural model um, kind of in uh, transparent background um, in, uh, in uh, concert with the um, structural model and the core walls um, and the rest, rest of the structure. In this view, we can also see that orange mechanical model then used with the structure, uh, structural model of the system. So we can see how those two models can work together and we could produce views and other output um, that we could use in our coordination. Now by supporting this reference model workflow, C Engineer gives you interoperability which really goes beyond Revit. Um, through this open BIM initiative, um, model exchange is possible with over 150 BIM offering tools. Um, and they don't, they're not just, they don't have to be just structural tools. So we have Revit or, or Vectorworks and ARCHICAD, which are architectural tools, Tecla and SDS2, which are fabrication level um, uh, functionality. Uh, we saw things with DDSCAD or MCAD for mechanical elements, um, using some Bentley products for uh, civil stuff. All this information can be imported and exchanged via the IFC file format. In addition, though, the associations are also actively supporting these open BIM initiatives um, through their own interoperability studies. So once that study, um, the AISC established a strategy for both short, long, uh, short, medium, and long-term interoperability with a focus on working with Building Smart and, and promoting IFC. And so you can see that here in, in the media, medium term that they're going to look to eliminate the, C, the SIS2 file type and really go full on IFC. The ACI, American Concrete Institute, is doing a similar thing with their BIM initiatives, um, writing specifications to investigate and promote the use of IFC in a larger BIM atmosphere. Lastly, in the United States, the Precast Concrete Institute has hired Georgia Tech to write a protocol and a set of standards to be used in the precast industry for the exchange of BIM information using IFC. Um, we, uh, SIA, recently participated with a number of other software vendors in a workflow inv investigation based on uh, these, these standards that were created by Georgia Tech. Now this trend is also happening on the government level and internationally. Uh, for example, the, the government in the United Kingdom um, recently released their 2016 BIM initiatives. So this is from the BIM task group. Um, and so they're really focused on BIM um, for all government projects. Now as we've seen, both workflows have their advantages and disadvantages. You know, we've seen a lot of flexibility in both the analytical model and the BIM reference model workflow. Um, there obviously there's been um, there's been workflows that are being used by many of our customers and, and probably many of you um, whether it's the analytical model or um, maybe a little less likely the BIM reference model workflow. Um, in most other softwares with um, ex with interoperability, the analytical model uh, workflow exchange is, is really the only option. Um, and so what's great about C Engineer is that these workflows are not mutually exclusive. It's possible and in, and really in many cases practical to use the analytical model and this BIM reference model workflow together in concert in order to create the most accurate and efficient exchange of structural model information from Revit to SIA or, or other analysis software in general. So this is actually something that uh, we kind of worked out, we kind of proved out with um, a client of ours. So in this case, we, we got this information, we got this particular building from, uh, as a Revit model um, from the client, and we could see very quickly that we had really two separate structures. We had this kind of office building structure that was steel, concrete, there were some curved elements, some, some sloping elements, concrete walls, concrete slabs, foundations. But we also had this kind of production facility. Um, this production facility, this particular client also not only had engineers in-house, but also had a, an in-house fabricator. And so this production facility, which was mainly comprised of precast elements, um, precast double T's, precast columns with corbels, uh, you know, we really were, wanted to look at how best to transfer this information. So when we started to investigate this, um, you know, we, we automatically uh, noticed some, some modeling nuances. Part of this was just the way the model was created in general. Um, part of it is just the way um, Revit deals with particular elements. So in this case, we can notice here very plainly um, the, con the precast column uh, with Corbel, we can notice that the analytical model doesn't really have any reference to that Corbel. So if we were going to import this analytical um, column into SIA or into any other analytical software, we would lose reference of the co Corbel. We wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't have that Corbel anymore. But it's certainly, as engineers, something that we needed to design. Additionally, you can see the precast double T with the opening here in the top right. Now, again, you can see the analytical line going right through that opening, really not having 
not really paying any attention to that particular opening. Again, as engineers, we need to design these particular precast planks for the fact that there's an opening there, that there's left, there's not material, there's a void of material in that particular location. And so, therefore, we kind of noticed that relying solely on the link really would allow, would give us simplifying assumptions when sending data either to analytical software or, or C engineer. So what we decided to do was a two-stage export. So the first stage here is we decided, okay, all the information that could be exported um, very practically using the link, um, the, uh, the steel profiles, the concrete profiles, even some of the precast uh, profiles that didn't have any openings or holes in them, you know, these very standard shapes that mapped very well to library-based um, um, elements, those were going to be transferred via the link. And so this is our model for transfer of information via the Revit link. The second part of this transfer um, is information that either didn't transfer in the link, um, so not supported items, for instance, the foundations, or items that we really wanted to pay specific attention to in our structural analysis software. And so these two items were primarily those items that we talked about before, um, the precast columns with corbels and the precast double T's. So we really wanted to give the engineer the opportunity to make engineering decisions whether or not they wanted to utilize the corbels, whether or not the holes were important in the precast planks, make those decisions in the analytical software and not have those decisions made for them by the limitations of the Revit link. And so once we did that, we were able to, um, we kind of, group together the two models. So we've got the information mostly in blue, which is the analytical model information that was sent via the link. The information in green then was exported via the IFC file format, that reference model workflow that we talked about before. And so now with this IFC information and the Revit information coordinated, we could begin to utilize the BIM toolbox and some of those conversion tools that we talked about earlier to convert um, 1D members into columns or um, the precast double T's into, into double T elements, or we could choose to convert it into plates so we can utilize the openings. But we were able to make those decisions, or we are allowing the engineers in that company to make those decisions within their engineering software. Now you'll remember, I mentioned that they had an in-house fabricator, so that was another part of the process that they were interested in. In this particular, mo this case, we exported the model to Tecla BIM site, but in their case, they were exporting directly to um, Tecla for fabrication. And so because, of, because Tecla is an open BIM partner, they support the, the import and export of IFC, we also have a direct analytical link that we can use to, to uh, send information um, from C Engineer to Tecla as well. So beyond exchanging data using either that direct link or the reference model workflow, C Engineer also offers users the ability to plug into the latest graphical scripting workflows as well. And really the way that this is done is through um, visual programming. And so kind of just a, a little review, what is visual programming? So uh, we say that visual programming is used to quickly create and edit complex 3D geometry and information, um, to automate routine tasks and applications, and then to create middleware kind of links um, between various softwares in order to integrate workflows. Um, a few ways that we do this, one is through Vectorworks and um, their graphical scripting technology called Marionette. So we can create information there in Marionette. You can see that's the top picture there. Um, the second, um, maybe a little bit more familiar for the majority of people in this uh, webinar, is the Grasshopper, um, using Rhino and Grasshopper to create graphical scripting and then being able to send that information um, to SIA. And then the final one is, is using Dynamo and, and how Dynamo relates to Revit. Now, Graphical scripting is certainly something that's maybe not new or, or maybe is new to you, um, but certainly being used. Um, one of the ways um, AECOM actually is using this is to quickly evaluate the feasibility of specific roof configurations for stadiums. And so the different stadium layouts need to have, obviously have very complex roof structures. So being able to look at, you know, these different circular or teardrop shaped roof structures very efficiently and see how the design or the geometry of that or the loading on those particular um, roof structures impacts the architecture, you know, they can do that very quickly using um, Rhino and, and Grasshopper. Other parametric studies including stuff like truss optimization and even topological optimization are, are possible as well. Um, here actually is just a quick vignette um, is the Grasshopper interface. You can see that within the Grasshopper interface we can make adjustments to the model by manipulating these sliders. These sliders you can see make those changes graphically in those two views uh, in Rhino. Once the sliders are, are set as appropriately, we can export this uh, to, as an XML file and then import it into C Engineer. 
once now it's in C Engineer, the user can add loads in order to run an analysis and, and obtain the design output. Upon completion then, the updated model can be sent back to Rhino by way of XML. Um, since this may be a new topic to you, we just wanted to post some resources about graphical scripting and, 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 this, and this sort of thing. The first is um, a free link that was created by actually AECOM, it's called Panda Lite. Um, so you can click on that link to download this free link or we'll actually post this information um, so that you can download it. It's a free grasshopper to C engineer link. Also, John Merchant at Geometry Gym, who creates a wide range of links um, for a wide range of products, has two specific C engineer links, one with Grasshopper and one actually converting IFC file information directly to C information. Those are available at geometrygym.com. And then the next two are actually BIM consulting companies. Case um, is a BIM consultant creating graphical scripting workflows for a variety of engineering firms. And then Nathan Miller at The Proving Ground, he um, works to create BIM interoperability tools as well. If you have any other questions um, about the graphical scripting or any of these particular links, we can certainly talk about those um, later or, or, or provide some more information about uh, where you can find these resources. So let's take a, a brief moment to kind of recap these three main um, interoperability workflows that we've, that we've discussed. The first, obviously, is this analytical model exchange, this direct analytical model exchange between Revit and in this case C Engineer. So this supports a direct data transfer based on member mapping. Um, the link here in this case is, is bi-directional. So changes can be easily pushed back in either direction from C to Revit, Revit to C. We saw those both in our earlier videos. Also, um, the link is expandable. So we can expand mapping tables to take into account custom families or, or other user mapping. Those are some of the pros. Now, on, on, the, on the con side, you know, really the lack, if you don't have an analytical model or you don't manage the analytical model, those are the real downfalls of, the of using the link. Because in that case, you're either going to run into no transfer or you're going to run into something where you have alignment and connectivity issues. Additionally, we have a limited amount of cross-sections um, because we're limited based on the libraries that exist both in SIA and both in Revit. And so custom cross-sections like cellular beams, three-plate members, hunch members, arbitrary members, those members wouldn't transfer because they're not tied to the libraries. As far as this BIM reference model exchange, this open BIM exchange, really we have no limit to geometry types that can be exchanged. Those tapered members, hunched members, um, cellular beams, shell-based elements, all that type of information can be exchanged. Um, really, it's an open file format, so you aren't tied to just one software. You can exchange information with over 150 different BIM applications. And what we saw um, in some of those earlier examples, it's not just analytical data. Non-analytical data, like architecture, like MEP, like civil, can be used um, to create your model, whether it's indirectly creating it through using it as reference geometry and being able to add loads just based on you know, the positioning of things, or it's directly converting those objects into native C objects like we saw in that um, precast parking garage. Now, some of the, some of the downfalls of, of this type of exchange, there's no mapping tables, which means no direct mapping of elements. There's also no alignment because, um, you know, you don't have an analytical model. So you're going to have to worry about, you're going to have to pay attention to alignment, um, maybe using the BIM toolbox like we saw in, in CIA before. Also, since the elements are general geometry, they're general solid elements, they're not native objects to any of the software, you're going to have to convert those. Either you're going to have to convert them automatic or uh, manually, like we saw in that video, or you're just going to have to use um, the geometry and kind of trace over it. Now, as far as the graphical scripting uh, workflow goes, really the pros are it gives us a really uh, quick ability to create and edit complex three-dimensional geometries. Um, gives us the ability to create automation using parametric elements, and then we have really great bidirectional exchange through the XML file format. Now, on the downside, it does require some computer programming experience. Not, and it's really not very practical for very typical structures. If you remember back to the structure that we saw um, for that kind of typical office building, probably wouldn't be a, a structure that you would um, have in Reb or have in Rhino, excuse me, get into Grasshopper and then you know be making exchanges all the time with with a software like like C Engineer. Now that we've taken a second to um, talk about or kind of recap these workflows, let's take a look really on how how these maybe got used on some real world projects. And so I have some examples of this. So um, in this first particular project, which is actually the winner of the special prize of the jury, jury in our 2013 user contest, um, our user contest is a contest we actually do every two years um, where users submit to us their kind of favorite and most exciting projects that then get voted on in, in different categories. 
Um, the company in this case uh, utilized the Revit model information to create an accurate structural model in C Engineer through the use of the direct analytical link. And so uh, being able to exchange that model from, uh, Re from Revit into C Engineer to build the SIA model. Um, in this particular building, actually designed by Evolve in the UK, they worked in the exact opposite direction, very similar to the way that we saw that AECOM roof structure working. So they were able to import the C engineer model that was created by the engineers directly into Revit, which they say worked seamlessly, seamlessly and created, created a lot, uh, saved them a lot of time. Um, that's where the construction drawings were produced. So the engineers controlled the model in SIA, and then the guys who were creating the final um, construction documents were able to control the model that was sent to them from SIA in Revit. Um, actually, uh, another one is Riverstone Structural Concepts out of Boise, Idaho. Um, they actually utilized the open BIM workflow to exchange IFC information, not only between Revit and SIA, but also Archicad. And so it allowed the company to create their documentation in Archicad, send that IFC information then to C Engineer to do the structural analysis, and then finally send that information to um, the architect who was using Revit. So this kind of 3D model exchange was happening between, in this open platform, between uh, three different software applications that wouldn't be possible with, with the standard analytical model links. The last one is AECOM. So AECOM, in this case, actually utilized custom scripting to create a round-trip data exchange between Rhino and C Engineer. And so they used Rhino, created that Rhino information, and worked iteratively with the architect to create that open and iterative design process to be able to send data constantly between Rhino, Grasshopper, and C Engineer. Now, once the information in C Engineer was created such that they had the structural portion down, they were able to then use the um, C Engineer link for documentation. So they were able to send the information from SIA to, Rev to Revit based on that link and then create their final documentation. So really now using, again, kind of a hybrid workflow, not the one necessarily that we talked about with IFC and Revit together, but with graphical scripting and the Revit link together. So creating a hybrid workflow, really showing that there isn't just one workflow um, that may fit for any one project. Really having flexibility in those workflows gives the users, the end user, a lot of um, options for how they can create, what they can create, and how they can exchange and collaborate with other uh, disciplines. Well, I, we've now reached the end of our presentation. Um, obviously, we're going to open up um, uh, the opportunity for you guys to ask some questions. But first and foremost, I want to thank you for your time and for your, uh, for your participation. Um, if you have any questions on anything that you saw here today, whether it was on the link, the IFC uh, exchange, um, the graphical uh, exchange with either Vectorworks or, uh, or Grasshopper, anything at all, um, we'd really like to set up individual meetings to kind of dig into really your particular companies and your particular workflows that you guys participate in on, on, a, on a daily basis and maybe talk about how some of what we talked about today can really go ahead to um, streamlining those workflows. And, and so with that, um, let's go ahead and open up um, this time for questions. All right, thanks, Ben. Um, so we did get a few questions, and then in during the presentation, uh, we've been answering present questions as we've been going through the presentation. Um, if any you have, if any of you have questions, please type them into the chat window, and we'll get to as many as we can uh, during the active live Q and A. Um, then I did get a, a number of questions revolving around the mapping table. Um, can you describe a little bit more about how the mapping table works and, and specifically with um, Revit families, custom Revit families? There seems to be a lot of customers, a lot of engineers who are creating their own Revit families, and that's causing some problems in the links between RAM and RISA. Sure. So um, as far as custom families, we know a lot of the people that we work with you know, aren't using the standard you know, predefined, pre-installed Revit families that come with Revit. And so they're making manipulations to the families, whether it's just changing the name of the family so it's specific to their company, or they're actually manipulating the family itself, taking particular um, steel members or, or whatever out that they, they know that their fabricator or, or where they get their steel from doesn't have. And so in that case, there's a few different ways to do it. We can do it directly within the model or directly within the link itself. Um, we can kind of map a, a, a 
totally separate family path, or there's actually um, a way to do it using kind of the XML and some text editors in the background. And so that way is actually, we have the PDFs that are documented on how to do that, and that's really for probably the IT or the person that manages the BIM process in your office. They could do it once and then push all those changes, all that information to every person using the link such that now the link is updated for everyone for their particular custom Revit families. Um, okay, cool. There, um, there was a lot of questions kind of just revolving um, around modeling and kind of um, object transfer. Um, uh, there, one is, you know, um, I'm using RAM and we're trying to deal with the transfer uh, of walls with varying thicknesses. Can SIA handle that? Sure, yeah. I mean, so really it's no different than handling any other transfer of, of you know, maybe walls that weren't of varying thickness. But say you had, an example, you had a, 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 an exterior wall that had a 12-inch wall, then a then a 10-inch wall, then an 8-inch wall. So you may want all of those walls to align at the exterior face of, of the walls. Now, one way that you could do that so that you can get an accurate transfer, not so such that the analytical lines are, are kind of jogged so they're not so they aren't aligned, is you can just use what's called the auto detect analytical line in, in Revit. And so that'll actually auto detect where things are supposed to connect and do that for you. But that's gonna give you then when it comes in C, it's gonna give you a center line based alignment for those walls. So those centers of that 10 inch, 8 inch, 6 inch, or 12 inch, 10 inch, 8 inch wall are going to be aligned. Now you can also, if you want, really want to align the exterior of the wall in C Engineer, and that's how you want it to show up in your analytical model, you could switch the analytical line in Revit to be on the outside face of that particular wall. So the analytical line can move on the inner or outer face, and then now you're going to get the analytical lines in C to then align to the outside face of the wall, therefore keeping all those variable thickness walls aligned. All right, cool. Um, there's a there were quite a number of um, kind of comments revolving just around um, the kind of the fidelity of the transfer. I got a lot of comments and questions about, you know, hey, listen, you know, we're using uh, Risa and it's good for one or two passes, but eventually it kind of breaks. Um, can you comment, is there any limitation in, in the link itself and the number of iterations that could happen between Revit and SIA in the direct link workflow? Um, there's really not. I mean, as far as you know, there's not a set limitation. Obviously, as you start to make changes um, and you start to um, send data back and forth, um, as long as you maintain, we looked at those unique identifiers when we were having the transfer, as long as those unique identifiers are maintained and the changes are made based on the elements for those unique identifiers, the changes are going to go back and forth. And so you're going to be able to get um, those changes to go back and forth. Now, if you start to do things where you kind of break the link, if you will, and you start to add objects in Revit that you don't want to transfer to SIA, or you're going to add objects in SIA that you're not transferring, now you've kind of broken that in a sense, um, and you're not going to get as good of a transfer. In my experience, um, you know, I think that if you're going from Revit to SIA or SIA to Revit, you know, making major transfers um, in the sense that you're sending a lot of data um, maybe at certain um, design development stages, maybe at certain um, stages where you want to create documentation, for instance, in Revit. I think that's prudent, but exchanging, you know, small, minute changes from SIA to Revit every day as the, CIA, as the, art, as the engineer makes changes, I just don't think is practical. Yeah, and then that kind of leads to another kind of follow-up question, which is, like, are we always exchanging the entire building model, or can we just do parts or pieces of the building model? So either. So you can either exchange the entire model, whether it's in IFC or C or the direct link, or you can choose one of the options in the link is to export only selected items. Okay. Um, in regards to the cleanup, there are quite a, a, a category of questions a, a, a revolving around model cleanup. And um, in your opinion, Ben, you know, wh where best should this cleanup happen? It should happen in Revit or should it happen on uh, the CAE side? Um, def for It kind of depends. So I think the majority of cleanup should certainly have where the structural engineer has the most control of those of that model in um, in C engineer or in the in the analysis software. Um, that's where the alignment tools in CI and, and just the ability to kind of manipulate geometry, grab nodes, drag nodes, drop nodes. You know, co you know, do that kind of things in C and really make that those changes easily. For Things like walls, uh, Revit has a very nice wall alignment tool which allows you to kind of snap the edges of walls together and, and so the alignment matches. So that's probably one tool that I would recommend using in Revit, but other than that I would certainly stick to using the majority of the tools in the analysis software. Um, okay, um, there were some questions regarding the graphical scripting. 
Um, first is, um, can customers create their own scripts or do they have to buy a plugin or, or an add-on? So both. So um, we have customers that are creating their own scripts. Um, really it's just an XML transfer so you can build your own script that would then just create an XML file which is going to get imported into C Engineer. Um, so customers are certainly doing that. Um, just obviously requires, like we talked about before, some, some visual programming knowledge. Um, as far as commercial products, you know, there are commercial products, whether it's the free product, Panda Lite from, from the guys at AECOM, or it's um, John Merchant's stuff in Geometry Gym um, using a, a Grasshopper link that's, that's commercial and created, um, you know, really either um, depending on the, the feasibility and the, the experience of, of your particular company, you know, you, can, you could do either. Okay, and then uh, kind of along those same lines, they're asking about, um, you know, basically the interoperability um, in this graphical scripting workflow with Revit. So can you talk a little bit about kind of the, how the model transfer works between graphical scripting and then Revit? Yeah, so in, I think really probably the way to talk about it is in, in terms of that, um, in terms of that AECOM model that we talked about last and where that, you know, in many cases, you're with, with with graphical scripting. You're not, um, you know, a lot of cases you have the architect using Rhino or, or SketchUp or something like that, and then the engineer is required to kind of rationalize the geometry and then get that into a place where he can do his engineering calculations and, and design and analysis. And so, in a lot of cases, that graphical scripting is on the front end before it gets into C Engineer or, or your analysis software. And then on the back end, really, you want to use utilize Revit for what it was created to do, which is create documentation, 3D, 2D documentation, sections, you know, elevations, plans, etc. And so then once the information from graphical scripting is into C Engineer, you, use, you can use the link or IFC to send that information to whatever your documentation tool is for final documentation. All right, perfect. Um, there was also a question, uh, you, you mentioned uh, Tecla in your presentation. Um, can you talk a little bit about the Tecla workflow and how that exchange happens and maybe even the exchanges with other BIM softwares? Sure. So the Tecla, Tecla specifically, um, since it's a, their strategic partner of ours through the Open BIM initiative, um, can exchange data very efficiently using the IFC file format. Um, additionally, though, we have a direct analytical link that sends the analytical model data from C Engineer into Tecla to create a Tecla model. And so that's based on mapping tables, just like the mapping tables um, in Revit and uh, SIA uh, work together. Um, other tools like SDS2, we can exchange um, information with SDS2 using IFC. And then, like I mentioned before, all of those BIM offering tools that are part of the Open BIM initiative, can it be, you can exchange data back and forth via the IFC file format. Um, all right. And then uh, the last question is, um, you know, where can customers go to kind of get more information about this, these kind of Revit workflows that you're describing? Yeah, so we have a lot of good documentation on our on our website, so www.cia.net. Um, within that, we have a, a whole page on BIM in general, so Open BIM has really been a large focus of, of Nemechek as a, as a corporation. Um, we also have some really nice tutorials on both how to exchange data from Revit to C Engineer with some example files and stuff, and also how to exchange data um, via the IFC workflow with example files and step-by-step -step guides. So both of those are are on our website. If, if you have trouble finding them, just let me know and I can, I can certainly um, provide you with those links and that information so that you can work through those in a trial if you like. All right. Well, um, I wanted to thank everyone's uh, attention and attendance. Um, you know, that kind of concludes today's presentation. There were a, a number of attendees. We had over 200 attendees in today's webinar. Um, so there were a number of questions that we weren't able to get to in this live Q&A session. Uh, we tried to answer as many as we could during the presentation. If we didn't get to you, we will get um, you answers to your questions um, after the webinar. Um, with that, then, I just wanted to thank you very much. Um, great presentation. And then this presentation will be recorded, and uh, a link, you should receive an email um, with a link to this recording um, sometime tomorrow. All right, with that, I'll conclude the presentation. Thanks, Ben. Thank you, everyone.